Hello and welcome back to another episode of An Intelligent Discussion. I am your host, Ben McElroy. You're here with Justin Woodcock and William Fick. Today, we have a very interesting topic, uh, one that I anticipate formulating some intense discussion. We're discussing what government is and what government should be in our own interpretations. So with that said, Will, what do you think government is? Well, I can tell you what government means to me and what it's supposed to be. Government is my provider and it is my protector. With that being said, it should not be an all encompassing umbrella. You know, we should have be able to have some wiggle room and be able to decide things for ourselves and leave room for other institutions such as business and enterprise. Okay. Why do you think that? Well, I believe that government is very good for certain things like road building and war fighting that business would not be good at because, you know, the entire point of enterprise in this capitalist republic of ours is profit and an any private enterprise will always put profit margins and returns above the well-being of the common good. And that's where the public sector gets the lead on certain things. Like I said before, on building roads and providing water supplies is the well-being of their population is at the center of their mindset. Whereas if you had a um, like the privatization of water, that company that provides water will find the cheapest water, sell it to the best customers for the highest price and everybody else is just going to be SOL. But when it comes to certain things like providing jobs, then that is definitely something that business would be better at as opposed to government. Okay. I I like I like a lot of what you said. Justin, I'll, I'll turn over the same question to you. What is government? What should it be? What does it mean to you? Before I forget, I just want to point out, I think it's interesting that Will says that like that's his opinion on what government means to him and that's also what government should be. Like when I hear that a government should be, uh, you know, providing <clears throat> or I guess protecting and making sure that the well-being of its citizens is at the center of its goals, like a lot of times that's not always necessarily the case. Oh, trust me, I wrote that. I wrote that down. To oh, you wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, everyone else got that. So it's like, yeah, that's how it should be. Um, what if it's not? <laughs> what government means to me, I guess, is honestly pretty similar to will i would say government to me i envision as an entity that we put together to safeguard our country i suppose so i guess if we're just talking generally it's something that a, a country puts in place to make sure that everything's going to run smoothly and like we're going to actually be able to accomplish things because like will said there's no way that a for-profit entity would ever be able to actually advance the goals of a nation, at least in a productive and less harmful way than an actual public government with public servants. Um, but that being said, when I think of what a government should provide, I think of the same thing that Will says, like infrastructure, like roads, water supply, electricity, internet, that sort of thing, um, a standing army. I don't think government should go as far reaching as like, making us all hapless, you know, individuals who can't even do anything for Just themselves. Just reduce us to cogs in the machine. Exactly. We shouldn't be cogs in the machine. The government in reality should be working for us, not the other way around. Right. Okay. I don't disagree with anything you guys have really said. Uh, well, I guess that's not actually true. I agree. I disagree a little bit, but have you guys seen the movie Wally -E recently? Not recently. I remember. Okay that's what like the bad side of like government making us look and like turn into hapless fools makes me think of right off the bat. Like we're just like so fat and happy in our own isolated environment that we don't realize what we've given up. Was that government or was that just robots? That's well, you know, I think there is something to be said. Ignorance is bliss. I disagree. You can't, I mean, it, Okay, if we're just going to do it, if we're just going to do it right here at the beginning of the episode, I don't let's think do it. Can, let's do it. We're I don't think you here. can disagree with that. You can't disagree that ignorance is like, that's the whole point of the saying. Like, ignorance is literally bliss. Like, you're happier when you don't know the harsh, cruel reality of facts. And, like, personally, I would rather know things 
and have to grapple with the repercussions of that than not. So oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to know. But that's what I'm saying. So that's that's arguably a happier lifestyle when you don't know. It's less pressure. It's less responsibility. Less things you have to deal with. Um, yeah, less of a liability. If we're gonna go, like, have you seen this movie? Very recently, Netflix came out with the movie Don't Look Up. And for anybody who's seen that movie, the plot line wouldn't exist if nobody knew that the asteroid was coming. All of a sudden, it would just hit, and the world would end, and everybody would die, and that would be that. Ignorance is bliss, and not knowing that everything that you know and care about is going to be destroyed is you know that's something to be said about that I instead that of just indeed. suffering through the anarchy and chaos on a biblical proportion i found it to be less comedic than it was like realistic i guess not realistic in the sense that it was like hyper realistic but like I, I, it was funny at points but i i wasn't like cracking up and dying at the whole thing but at the end of it i was like damn this could definitely happen. Like so it my, has my third time watching it, I was scale. definitely cracking up. Yeah, Ben, what what are you what do you think here? I I think fundamentally as an individual, and you know, you mirrored my sentiment, Justin. You're like, I'd rather know, right? Like the the interesting portion of life to me is that. I do recognize that my actions have consequences and consequences doesn't necessarily mean like a negative outcome. It just means that when I decide to do something, I am also choosing not to do other things, right? Like I have a finite amount of time. I have a finite amount of attention. I have a finite resources. What can I do with my stuff to be intentional? It's the same thing with this idea of ignorance is bliss. Like, I would rather not live in a lackadaisical, you know, quote unquote paradise and, you know, miss the rising, you know, mountains of trash heaping around our cities to the point where we have to leave the planet. I would rather say, hey, let's remove ourselves from the illusion of like, you know, cleanliness, safety, you know, whatever, and realize that there are large issues and we can, you know, counteract those things. But it's not blissful just because you don't notice it. You know, a approaching thunderstorm is not blissful when it hits. You just don't notice it. You don't have like the buildup to it, but then you're still left with the repercussions. Um, okay. I don't necessarily disagree with any of that, I think, but I do have a question and I don't know if we're going to have to find our catch ourselves throughout this episode, but uh, we may have to distinguish between American government, I suppose, and government as a whole government as an entity. But Ben, question for you, and I do want to hear what Will has to say. When you talked about, we took that that slight shift right there, and you were talking about how I recognize that my actions have consequences. That doesn't necessarily mean good or bad. It just means that I have a finite amount of time, resources to accomplish things. Do you think government plays by the same rules as you? Like, do you think they take responsibility for their... Hell no. I only have a year to complete this. Like, let's... No. Yeah. Well, and so this is one of the things where I was, I, I chuckled to myself when you guys said that we expect government to provide infrastructure, roads, maintenance to things. And I'm chuckling to myself. I'm like, I'm from Illinois. The government in Illinois runs about, about as efficiently as like an engine with no oil or pistons or <laughs> any other of the core components. Speak for your own state, bro. <laughs> well, and, that, and that's just it. Obviously, it's it's an isolated state, but... I can take you right now to roads in Illinois that have been worked on for four years. Like the cones have been there the whole time. Crews have been out working. Nothing's changed. And it's like, what are these people doing? Like, If they got paid to complete the job and not paid hourly or like a commission on the actual job length, like would that change the efficiency with which road work, as one example in Illinois, is completed? Probably, but it's one of those things where it's a government, it's a government choice and the government of Illinois is massively in debt. It's not a priority. Um, so long answer short, no, I don't think the government operates under an impending sense of efficiency or responsibility. It is implicit in almost any organization to not take responsibility for your own role. Personally, what makes you think that? 
Next time somebody messes up at Menards, we'll ask them who did it. <laughs> Tell me how many fingers I've been, I've been down that road. Else. Right. I've been down that road. Now, I've been down that road, and it's a sucky road. Like, when you actually goof and it's your fault and you have to, like, you know, look a business owner, especially, like, a small business owner in the eye and be like, hey, I screwed up. You know, I did this. That sucks. But how much better is it to say, hey, I messed up. I'm sorry, rather than saying, oh, well, I only messed up because I received incomplete training from so-and-so who taught me this, but they were taught, like, you know, like, take responsibility, man. Coming back at you with some of that Jordan Peterson stuff right there, Justin. So would you disagree, Will? I'm, I'm curious. Disagreeing on whether or not governments take responsibility for their actions. Yeah. Well, I think they do take responsibility in one form or another. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to laugh in the middle of what you're saying, but like, did you say government taking accountability for its actions? If the office holder doesn't follow through on their promises, they won't get reelected. That requires a certain amount of accountability on their part. Okay, like, yes, you're true. <laughs> like, what you're saying is true, but it's so funny because sometimes it's not true. Like, not true. Like, oh, and even, even forget about an office holder, government as an entity, government agencies, like, whether it's a military branch, CIA, FBI, ATF, or whether it's, you know, the Department of Transportation, like, oh, they just accountability. Sheesh. Yeah, don't even know her. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then what? how would you solve this problem then? What are your alternatives? <clears throat> oh, Will, how are you going to do me like that, man? I wasn't I wasn't trying to propose a solution. Now I got to come up with one? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, if you, if you get a good one and it's in like, it's in recording, like we'll submit it. You'll get like a Nobel Peace Prize. It'll be great. Like, okay. <laughs> see what All you right. got, dude. Um, no pressure. Accountability in government is such an interesting concept because... I think about what you say, Ben, like when you're a small business owner and you goof and like the right thing to do is to take accountability because you're dealing with one individual who you wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to go to this person and be like, hey, Will, you know, I'm sorry. I in, I installed the solar panels on your roof incorrectly. I really apologize. Like, let me hit you with a refund or, you know, let, we're going to redo it free of cost, whatever. Most of the time because I'm dealing with you directly and you've been working with me, that's probably going to be okay. I mean, sometimes it's not, sometimes you really mess up. Sure. In the case of government, how do you, so I'll give a personal example from my home state. In the case of the Flint water crisis that Flint is still dealing with to this day, 2022. So I want to say this, it was 2008. So we're 14 years, 14 years later. Okay, when this happens, they don't even acknowledge it initially. They're like, oh, damn, lead in your water. That's crazy, guys. Like, you That's wild. That, yeah, you should really get that checked out. And then it starts to come out that the state government dropped the ball, and then the federal government dropped the ball, and then all this attention gets garnered, and this, the civilian populace gets upset, and they're like, you should do something about this. And what I all – at least what I have seen consistently happen with the American government, especially in recent years, is everybody says you should do something about this. And then the politicians just get on that same side. They're like, yeah, somebody should do something about this. And it's like, you guys should do something about this. So in terms of like accountability, when it gets flung at them, a lot of the times it's not even about deflecting like this is so-and-so who's holding up the bill or this is so-and-so who's blocking this action. It's just them like, completely taking a step back like oh well, i don't even have any power to do anything like this like i can't fix this problem when in reality they're all the people that could fix that problem so i don't know i, I hope that made sense it's just to to an extent what you said makes sense i think that the only way to enforce an i a modicum of accountability into a republic or a representative democracy is to truly impose term limits on all individuals of any office and not just term limits, but where you cannot run in secession. And I think the reason that that is important. Wait, 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 hang on. I need to clarify something real quick. When you say not run in secession, does that mean that you can't run for reelection? Right. 
So, so like for instance, ever like you can't like no, you hold no, office like, you hold I'm, I'm one okay office you, once and then you're done. I'm okay with you being able to run multiple times, but there needs to be a span of time. Like for instance, if I join the now Virginia House of Representatives, you know what's my term? Two years, four years. Regard I I forget what maybe it's four. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Say it's four years. My four years comes up. I am ineligible to run for the House of Representatives for the next term. So can I sneak in here really quick? And I just want to I want to hear the rest of your argument. I just want to throw my two cents in that. I feel like what you're describing right now makes it easier to not take accountability, because if I had a four year term in office, like let's say I was in Congress or whatever, and I blocked a bill or really dropped the ball on classified information. I mean, what have you? I messed up. And then everyone was like, take accountability for this. And I dodged it. And then I wasn't allowed to even run for re-election anyways. I could just fade into the background after my term, have two people come, you know, and fill the gap. And then I could just pop back up in eight years. True. And then if, if the two people who ran in between my sessions or in between my terms were just awful, and they remember me as a person, not as what I didn't take accountability for. They might just vote me right back in. Whereas if you had back-to-back -back terms and I'm refusing to take accountability for my actions, that's fresh in my my. Um, True. Well, and I, I, think, I think the current political system would very quickly dig that back up on you regardless. Mm -hmm. But in the example that I'm currently going off of is very similar to the Roman Republic's ideas of like the consul. Mm -hmm. You can get elected one time and for one year and that's it like not again not multiple times in your lifetime like one time and it's a huge honor to be given that responsibility right but then your entire political agenda needs to be fit into that one year if you have potentially 60 years to achieve your political desires like some of these you know people in the house of reps and the senate like you should not be in a seat of government power for 50 consecutive years. Are you truly the best person for the job, the most efficient, the, you know, the one with the best intentions, like the best ideas? It's possible, but I think that the, the slowing down and the chunkiness and the division in our current form of American government really is starting to reflect this idea of like, man, there are some truly powerful individuals on both sides of the political agenda that have been in those positions since my parents were little kids. And, you know, maybe they'll miss one election here or they'll drop out or they'll change. But you, these names and like the, the wealth, the power, the, the political sway that they have, it seems uncharacteristic of what their office should hold. And I think that's an, a shame. Okay, so it sounds like to you that government, part of what government means to you personally, Ben, is suitability. You know, the suit, like the suitability of a government to its constituents. You're saying like it, it, we shouldn't have old politicians who can't connect with the younger populace. So if that is true, like if you do think government should be suitable to the people it's representing, what do you think is more important, an efficient government or a suitable one? I would have to agree with Justin here. Those old guys, the, those power brokers who know how the game is played, those are going to be the ones who actually accomplish something because they know how to move the levers of government in favor of their constituents. Because, again, the whole point of a representative democracy is following through on the promises that you made your electorate when they elected you into office. And the, the people like Mitch McConnell, who have been in the Senate forever, they know they know what to say, they know who to talk to, they know what relationships to make. And I can guarantee you that if Mitch McConnell was removed from the equation and replaced with a younger Pete Buttigieg, or, who didn't have those connections and didn't have that relationship and did not have that experience, I feel Congress would become far more ineffective than it actually is today. Because you need people who have that knowledge and that know-how and have put the time in to know how the game is played to get stuff done. I hate that I agree with Will. I hate that because I am a huge proponent of like, we should not have an 80 year old president. We should not have a, you know, 77 year old. Careful now. Uh, we don't want to get kicked off uh, YouTube here. 
Oh, whoa, whoa. Okay. I, I don't have a problem with it. I think I was still Spotify. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. We shouldn't have political leaders who are 75 plus. Like, no, nothing against, not, not to be ageist. I'm just saying. Like, when you, strictly from like a human standpoint, like how, from a, from a biological standpoint, when you phase out of the group that comprises the majority of the country, like the, the majority of this country is not 75 plus years old or even 70 or even 65. They're all, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50. So when the majority of our politicians are not in that group and the, the, the main group is not being represented, we need to bring those people in. But I say I hate that I agree with Will because if we just brought in a bunch of fresh faces, then I think the efficiency scale would be clocked back multiple pegs because they would have to relearn everything. They'd have to make new connections. How does this work? Whereas we have these people in there who are sim simply in there because they've been in there for 20, 25, 30 years. They know how to play the game. They have powerful connections and they do get things done, but they don't get things done for their constituents. They get things done for, you know, corporate interests, sometimes for their state. I mean, you know, some, you know what do you your think corporate that? interest comment gives me an interesting idea and how I was saying earlier in this episode that it was the vote and the electorate that they had to follow through on. We're seeing corporations and business enterprises that are accumulating the same amount of wealth as nation states at this point in age. And when they start donating to campaigns and buying out, I'm using air quotes here, politicians, um, how do we feel about that shifting allegiance of the people that are now occupying office? They are responsible, not necessarily to the citizenry, but to an enterprise instead. Despicable. The first person I think of is Kristen Cinema. Just the absolute like corporate sellout. Like has completely forgotten about her constituents, refuses to hold um, town halls or meet with anybody that actually voted for her and simply just votes or doesn't vote based upon who her largest donors are. And I mean, I, I'm not a fan of corporate interest having so much sway. Obviously, that's inevitable. This is a capitalism. Everybody can donate to who they want to donate to. But at the same time, like, if you're giving tens of millions of dollars to a candidate, like, that's almost for, for one entity to own legal bribery for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's an interesting question you've posed, Justin. I want to, I want to finish the thought that we were discussing previously. Excuse me, Will, that you posed. I want to finish Justin's thought. I believe that should there be firm term limits, you would not be worried about having a political career as much as the follow through of what your, your run was based upon. Because mm. if you are only allowed one term every decade, you know, whatever, whatever the restriction becomes, you know, you're no longer Mitch McConnell, who's been in the Senate forever. You're, I've had one or maybe two terms in my political, you know, my, my entire life. What are we basing these upon? If, if you get into an office and re-election is coming up in four or two or, you know, whatever many years, the first half of your, your, your term is going to be spent actually doing what you said you were going to do. The second half is going to be saying, how do I get reelected? That should not be your focus as somebody who's holding public office. I wonder Personally. if Will and I are on the same page. Go ahead, Will. I agree with Ben on having one term limit if it is a very long term, like 10 years. I'm just throwing that number out there because I have reservations about always having a rookie in office. Hmm. Yeah, that, that was my thought. If you always have freshman congressmen sitting in the House of Representatives, they are going to say, make the same rookie mistakes that their predecessor made because they just do not have the experience. Whether they be successful business leaders or occupied a prominent position in another area of government, Congress is a different animal. I'm not even involved in politics, and I know that. So if you have only one term limit, for your life in Congress, for example, and it was eight or 10 years, and that was it, I feel that would be a good middle ground for us to agree on, where you just have that one term, but it's a long term where you can focus on building that relationships, getting that experience that you need to make stuff happen. I'm, I'm intrigued. I like it. 
I have a little bit of a reservation with giving 10 years is a long time. As opposed to the Roman senators who oversaw your consuls that served for life. Fair. Um, why I say that and why I think it's important and may, maybe 10 years is the appropriate amount of time. And maybe it's just my youth and, you know, relative short lifespan of only two, you know, 2.3 of those political terms. Um, but if a large majority of government all gets elected at the same time and they are all of a similar mindset, similar belief system, similar ideology, similar orientation, you have set yourself up for a massive shift in government ethics, government ethos, government operations. And that can be really good if those shifts are positive or that can be incredibly detriment, detrimental to the society if for 10 years, you know, inefficiency, corruption, you know, intentional change on the portion of the population is subjected. Part of the beauty, you know, like obviously there's all of these drawbacks that we all talk about the American political system. One of the biggest pluses is you're never really in office or in control of the Senate or, you know, whatever long enough to permanently, you know, inhibit your biases into the governing body. Because if everybody gets mad at what you're doing, you're out and they give the other side in, you know? Yeah. Ben, I, I agree with you. I guess, let me ask you guys is not everyone is built to be a career congressperson or a career Senator. I mean, not everyone will be a Joe Biden, a Mitch McConnell a Nancy Pelosi, a Kevin McCarthy, where you have a 10, 15, 20 plus year time in some kind of public seat. Um, like you have, you have freshmen congressmen and congresswomen who will come in, serve their one term and then be gone and never be elected again. Um, so I get what you're saying, Ben, when you say that's dangerous, if you have a, an entire class elected and they are all in there for 10 years, who's to say that they're not all of the same ideology. I mean, we would hope that they would differ, but if they're not, it could be dangerous. But at the same time, it's like, why would what, it be dangerous? Well, kind of like what Will just said, if it's all one single group and there's not really uh, anyone to dissent or, or block, you know, there's no checks and balances. Like if it's just one group steamrolling because they have 10 years, then I've, I could see that being quote unquote dangerous, I suppose. No, I'm not saying any specific group, just if one group had power and they decided that they were going to roll with it. But I'll come I in there with a specific see... group. Huh? I'll come in there with a specific group. Okay, okay. How, how say... long? Oh, sorry. I was going to go like Germany, World War, pre-World War II. Like how long was the, the Hitler in office before he'd steamrolled his way into being dictator? Less than 10 years. Okay, so yeah, I mean. In, yeah, for in, those in, of you who don't know, Hitler was elected, by the way. Yes, that is also very true. For those of you who don't know, he, he maintained power under, air quotes, dubious circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Not oh, long knives. Oh, gosh, yeah. I was going to say, what is the difference between having a 10-year term and a career politician who's going to get reelected anyways? Because there are those freshmen that are going to get you know voted out. But also, there are those people who are there to stay. Like, they're going to win and win and win. So it's like, what's the difference? Why does it matter if we give them 10 years? Because they're just going to win anyways. Because for a congressman who has to run for re-election every two years, has to fight for his job. That takes a lot of time and resources away from another issue that could use his attention. Mm -hmm. Right. And not even just use his attention, but is Congress in session while half of Congress is running for re-election while they're campaigning, while they're doing all these things like, does the government slow down to accommodate this? Oh, well, we're going to change the guard. So let's just slow down and like, you know, figure out before we try and pass these large bills one way or the other, is the house going to stay conservative? Is it going to go liberal? Is, you know, that just blows my mind. Um, I think one of the interesting perspectives and something that you kind of brought up, Justin, if it was 10 year terms for office, can you imagine if like FDR got into the presidency at a younger age? 
the president should never be 10 years. If we're to spitballing. Well, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I mean, I'm not saying that he should be, but can you imagine somebody like FDR? Oh, yeah. If he'd gotten elected at a young age, he'd probably still be president today. Like, <laughs> I, no. You don't he'd, think so? Okay, no. It, no, he'd be dead, dude. The presidency well, killed FDR if it wasn't polio. I think, I think polio. The presidency <laughs> has a way of wiping <laughs> people out. Dude, I mean, if you look at Obama when he got elected in 2008 and at the end of his presidency, it looked like you took him that out of a turkey fryer. went through it. I mean, he came in with zero grays. Now he's all gray yeah. and missing hair. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's the most stressful position in the world. If, if you're if you're like if you're physiologically capable of handling that much stress. Sure. Why wouldn't you still be in the president today? But. I'm 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 curious. I'm, I want to hear your guys' thoughts. I want to make it very clear. I am not a like pro pro Trump guy. The way that Trump handled the stress of being the president was possibly the best I've ever seen it done. Can you elaborate? Like it just didn't seem like it bothered him. Like the man is not much younger than Joe Biden. And just from a from a way he carries himself, from a way he acted, from a way that he made sure he took time to like be recreational, he caught like a ton of fly for this. And again, I'm not necessarily saying that he should have been out like golfing, you know, a hundred days out of the year, whatever crazy shit he did one year. But it's one of these things where like Obama, you know, he's in his fifties and he looks like he's in his seventies, but Trump is in his seventies and like he chilling. Like, he doesn't Trump, care. Trump does not look good. Don't don't try to don't try to do. Well, that. I'm not I'm not it's saying not he's a good. picture of health, but I don't think it hit him the same way it did like George W. Bush, Obama. Okay, but you know, it also probably didn't hit. I guess I see what you're saying, but it probably didn't hit him the same way because he was out of the office so much. Like that's why he wasn't as stressed because he was he was probably dealing with it better because he was on the course. That means he's not doing his job. I don't disagree. You can't be stressed if you're not at work, bro. <laughs> yes, you can. I guess so, but especially if your like wife hates you. <laughs> That's another topic for another time. Um, while Will is away, Justin, I think another thing that was brought up earlier that I kind of want to turn back to. We kind of touched on this idea of government. Is it inefficient? Should it be more efficient? is there certain situations where the government should do things and it shouldn't be left up to privatization or for profit? Do you think anything would change if the government was audited as if it were like a not for profit or if it was for like, cause again, like the, the corporate hemorrhaging of the government is concerning to me. You know, what do you mean by that? For instance, I can't remember if it was the CIA or the FBI or I'm pretty sure it was the CIA, but they were basically getting audited by Congress. And they're like, can you account for this like $300 billion? And they're like, no. <laughs> and the congressman was just like, you have no idea what happened to this money. And they're like, we do not know what happened to this money. It's like, hold up. That's wild. So that's true. That it's wild. That is insane. But like, but like, and that's just an isolated event. But even like, I'll give you another example. My grandfather used to work for NASA, but it was NASA while they were working for the government under like government contracting. And literally, and I, I have relatives in the military as well, and it's the same deal. Like, they were on a you use every single penny in the budget. Or you lose it because next year, if you don't use it all, you won't get the same funding. And so they would just buy things and throw them away to the point where, and they had to like actually like hire security guards to monitor the trash sites because they were throwing away like thousands of dollars worth of tools every week just because they had to blow this money. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. But why are we as a, as a public paying the taxes that funds this machine of using more money because everybody likes to have more money available to them, right? Like if, if somebody was to say, Ben, would you prefer to have a hundred thousand dollars or $10,000 to run your company for a year? It's like, give me a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I can do more. 
A great example. During the Afghanistan war, the current founder of Black Rifle Coffee Company was a Green Beret, and they had to spend their budget. And he's like, can I get a $50,000 espresso maker? And they approved it. And it's in a military base in Afghanistan. Why? I'm not saying they well, don't need to drink coffee. I don't get what's so America I, does I, have a reputation trying to ask boiling its soldiers. And I, again, our soldiers reserve all of our respect, love, and best treatment. If the government were a publicly traded company in those situations, they would like be taken out to the woodshed. Like it'd be like, absolutely not. Things are going to change. Like we are not going to allow this because if you can operate for a, you know, a fraction of what we're currently using, we're going to take those resources and put them somewhere else. But there's this perpetuation of this idea where like, oh, well, we spent $600 billion on our military last year. Let's do even more this year. Again, I'm not saying that the military doesn't need to be a massive spending priority for America. I'm curious, what, is there a way to make it more efficient? I think there is a way to make it more efficient. And I'm going to take it back to the very beginning of this episode where we said that where government had the leg up on private enterprise was indulging in these sort of projects that do not net profit and are re like they're always inefficient in the way that they spend money like you can't make money building roads yeah you can have tollways but roads you know all the roads through illinois cost tens maybe hundreds of millions of dollars are you're not going to recoup that through tollways that's part of the reason why i believe that government exists is to spend that kind of money because i like driving on roads i don't want to take my sedan through a cornfield to work every day i'd rather drive on the asphalt like the way it's designed to that's the point. Yeah, well, I think you hit the nail on the head. That's the point. No one else can do that. Literally nobody, a, a for-profit business cannot build roads and forever, at least. They can't do it forever like the government can because they would go they would go bankrupt. Precisely. And I I will pay taxes. I, I pay my taxes. I will admit that. And I will continue to pay my taxes as long as my the way that I live my life doesn't change. What, what they do with that tax money, that's their problem. You know, as long as I can pay my rent, buy my groceries, have some spending money every now and then, and I'm not totally infuriated when I look at my deductions on my pay stub, then what's the problem? Yeah, Ben, I guess I'm honestly confused at your question, what you're asking. Like, are you saying that if we audited the government and made their spending programs more efficient that in theory, like maybe we could be taxed less? I think Ben's uh, giving us some libertarian vibes. Well, because here. yeah, that's I, I just don't, I don't ever foresee a situation where we like audit government. Like, let's just say NASA. Like, NASA has a hundred million dollar budget, and then they audit them, and they're like, NASA, why the hell did you spend ten million dollars on you know solid gold coffee and espresso makers? And then they were like, oh, well, we had to use our budget, and they'd be like, okay, well now you're only going to get ninety million dollars because you wasted ten million on nothing, like. They're still going to take that $10 million and they're not going to say, oh, well, we don't need $10 million. They're just going to go put it somewhere else. They're going to go put it in the military or they're going to put it in the Department of Education. Like, I don't ever foresee a situation where we audit them, catch them doing something incorrectly. And then they're like, OK, guys, you're right. We don't need that money. Maybe we should just drop your taxes or something like they're always it's always going to be like that. To be clear, I wasn't necessarily saying that. I was okay. positing the question of, is there a way to change the, the current status quo of how things are done? Mm -hmm. Now, that said, you guys bring up an interesting point, and I'm not sure that I truly align with libertarian ideals. Um, it's the part where the ATF is going to start tuning in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the interesting thought that that evokes in me I am concerned with the amount of things I pay taxes on. And maybe that's the crotchety old man in me just coming out a little bit and he's like, hur -nur, hur -nur, hur -nur. Um, and again, this is only primarily an issue for me because as a history major and as someone who's read a, a lot about the founding of this country and the transformation that America has gone through from, you know, being settled as an English colony through the present, taxation has changed dramatically and 
the things that we pay taxes for that we just take for granted now, like literally wars have been fought over. That's why the Revolutionary War was started was over taxes on tea and stamps. And it really wasn't a lot of taxes. I mean, that's not the only reason. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm well, not attributing the. I gotta. I gotta say, Ben. Okay. No taxation without representation. Well, right. That's what I'm saying. Like I, I'm getting taxed right now, but I'm represented. I'm. Re rep I don't know why I said it like that. I'm represented, but. Kind no, because so. you are. You you live in the United States of America is a representative democracy. No, for sure. That's for sure. And don't get me wrong. I'm. I'm like. Let me clarify. I pay my taxes. I enjoy the benefits. Are we all of clarifying government? this? Are you guys not paying taxes? <laughs> well, and, well, and here's the thing: the way the way Will said it, he's like, "I just want to be clear. I pay my taxes," and like he just basically made it sound like you and I, Justin, do. He not. got this like, super <laughs> ominous letter in the mail from the IRS after the last episode, and they were like, "Listen, we're going to be tuning into the next one, buddy." Well, so actually, I was on hold with the IRS for two hours yesterday. Tax time. Uh, anyway. Um, I'm I'm chill with taxation with representation, but why am I paying income tax and then sales tax on everything that I buy? Oh yeah, and when I buy a piece of property, I pay property tax on it on an annual basis in perpetuity. Like how many times do I need to pay the government to own my home or my land? Okay, like I don't think that's an unreasonable question. Like, again, like I'm totally fine if like the government's like, hey, man, you bought this house and for us to do X, Y, and Z, we're going to charge you this one time. Cool. But now, if how that much would that one time tax be? Ooh, ooh, that's the question. Like, I, I, I'm not. Go ahead. No, I'm not. I am not at all qualified to speak on tax law. There are other people that are way more credentialed than I who can speak on this with authority. But the, things like the sales tax and the property tax, like those specific taxes go to different parts of the economy. And I would assume the reason that you pay property tax every year is to pay for things like the sewer lines and the electric poles that line the streets and all that. Because you're not, you know, the sales tax that you pay at JCPenney buying some jeans isn't going to pay for your plumbing i'm pretty sure you know correct that, me if i'm wrong the most old man tax situation you, <laughs> possibly. you go to jason so Penny's if you if you were going to pay a one-time property tax how much would that be how like what what amount would you give the government that they believe would be fair for them to keep servicing you with things like sewage and plumbing and it would be tax an and, and would not like I I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not answer your question because you brought up something that really, I really wanted to touch on. Okay. Because you used the word fair. How okay. much is, how much would you have to pay that is fair? Okay. Who decides what is fair? The electorate. Okay. Now the electorate change, right? So, in our in our current set of government, somebody someday decided to say, hey, we're going to put sales tax on every single purchase in the United States of America. OK, that's not that got that's, that's not from the federal government. You don't think so? Is that only that's like, a state? That's, that's, that's a state government. State has yep. a sales tax. So is income tax, by the way. Yeah. And so there are states without income tax. Texas. There are states without property tax. OK, fair, fair, 100 percent. But even at the state level, that was that was that was that was an electorate decision that the people who elected that or like you know and placed that in are no longer there, right? Mm -hmm. And depending on which state you live in and when that happened, they're not even alive anymore in some cases. So, so <laughs> can we just reassess some of this shit? Like, <laughs> okay. I feel you, except now, Will, I was going to slightly change the tax topic, so I don't want to go yet. Please take it away because okay. I'm going to move on to a different type of tax. So I want you to. Well, I want to bring it to income tax. I hope that's where you're going with this. No, I was going to bring it to a state tax. Okay. Well, Will, go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah. Oh, I was just egging you on, trying to get you to talk more. Well, I will. Trust me. Um, I don't know if that's a can of worms I want to open. Justin, go ahead. Do it. 
do we'll it. Circle do back. it. We'll the, circle sh- back. Do the shit that all of us have said on this podcast so far could probably get us into trouble. <laughs> so you might as well just double down. Guess I can never get a real job, so I might as well start my own company. <laughs> <laughs> Income tax, I mean, I don't think I'm definitely not advocating for the abolishment of income tax. Income tax actually makes sense. Um, oh, look at look at Ben's like, oh no, we're gonna do it. I mean, it's just another way to generate revenue, and also, it does make sense to tax people more who make more. I'm not saying that they should be like absurdly taxed, but I mean, if you look at okay, Ben, if you're talking about things that <clears throat> were written into law by people who aren't even around anymore or whatever. Okay, billionaires and corporations and everything, they used to pay, they used to be the highest tax bracket. They used to pay 75 to 80%. Like individuals used to pay, you know, 80%. So that wealth was relatively equally distributed. Now it's the complete opposite. Those people are, they're supposed to be paying more, but in reality, they're paying the least amount out of everyone. And so at, at times they're paying nothing. No, so that's that's a, Elon paying like five billion in taxes this year, though. <laughs> that's not. Is that's this, not is, income tax. Now, why not income tax? Why is the elite paying less in taxes? Because of tax law, literally. Whoa, because whoa, of tax whoa, law. Wait, 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 wait. I, wait, wait, wait. You say why are they paying less? Yeah, no, no. You, no. If, you say, if, if you said oh, that okay. the one percent, you know, at the top of the social hierarchy, are paying the least amount in taxes percentage wise why is that okay because and, yes okay okay you are you are time outing because, time out. okay go ahead please at the federal level when when you as an individual file your taxes will they pay the most tax like it's proportional to your income and it scales going up all right and so like i'm I'm going to pull it out because I have the federal the federal tax bracket. But I think what Will is saying is these people, even though they're in a higher tax bracket, proportionate to what they're making, they're paying the least. Like an individual who's making 30000 is, if you made it in a proportionate sense, is paying more based on what they actually made versus a billionaire who's you know, paying millions in taxes. But what they actually made that year you know, it's less than someone in a, in a well, market. yeah. And, and obviously if you're making $30,000 at 10% or yeah, I guess you'd be in the 12% tax bracket. Um, yeah, that's going to hurt you a lot more, but if you're, if you're making $518,000, you're paying 37% taxes on all money that you've made. What if and you make so over a million? It, it caps out at 37 for individuals. That's 37%. exactly my point is, is you, you basically get screwed. If you find yourself in between brackets, you get screwed. And it's a cheat code the second you transcend, um, you know, that that level, like once you break over a million or even if we're talking about 100,000, making 100,000 or just over, I want to say 101 as an individual will put you in a different bracket than somebody making, you know, 98,000. So if you're paying if you're making 98,000 and paying a large tax or I guess a less tax, but then you it'll keep... depend if you're married too. But yeah. Exactly. So. What I'm saying is if you are in one bracket at the top and you don't make enough to get out of there, that's arguably a better spot than making more money, but being 100%. at the bottom of the next bracket. Right. For instance, if you make $100,000, you know, your income tax is close to 30%. Mm-hmm. And so you're already going to be paying thirty grand in taxes. And so now from your initial gross $100,000, you have $70,000. And then from that, you still have to pay your property taxes. You still have to pay all the other taxes. And then you still have to pay for living essentials. If you made $80,000, now you're paying 22% taxes. So it may work out in some of those cases where you do become better off for not getting paid more. Absolutely. The reality though, and I think Justin, this is something that you may have been getting ready to touch on, Incredibly wealthy people don't pay income tax. Correct. Because they're smart people Report. and they hide their income. From no, taxes. it's not even that. I mean, it's it's a matter of coming from the financial sphere and like learning more and more about this. I mean, yes, they they you're able to hide your income or Air take massive deductions and whatnot, mm-hmm. whatnot. But when you're a billionaire, you're not. 
I don't know if this is a common misconception. I know not with you guys, but just people out there. You're, like you're not getting paid some ridiculous salary of like ten million dollars or something. Like you you might not even have a salary. Like all of your wealth is being accumulated practically through assets. Like almost one hundred percent through assets. So you're talking not, about you're, passive income. Almost, but yeah, I guess, but not even just passive income, just <laughs> stock options, like ownership. And so, right, like, it, 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 you know, you're paying Jeff capital Bezos gains, just 25 capital gains, income tax, you can't offset. There's right. nothing that you can offset with unless you lower your income. Capital right. gains, you can offset with losses. So that's why they can net a zero. 100%. And so this, this kind of circles back to this current idea that I see and I'm honestly terrified of this idea of like, you know, tax the rich, eat the rich, like, you know, make them like, make them pay. It's like, Ooh. this is like, well, and so this is, it's an interesting thought to me. And again, maybe I have a different background than most people my age at college or university, but I don't feel entitled to the wealth that other people make. You know, I don't see other successful individuals and be like, God, like, I deserve something that they make or what, what they're doing. Like they make so much money that like, surely There's no such thing as a wealthy communist. <laughs> facts. I Big completely facts. agree with now, you. Now I got something might seem a little inflammatory. I want to hear, get you guys' opinion on, on this. this podcast. Oh yeah. No way. Dude. All right. <laughs> we need the rich. We need the, we need the billionaires and we need the 1%. We need them. We like the Jeff Bezos, the Elon Musks, the Bill Gates of the world. C civilization, humanity as a whole needs them. Okay, so I 100% agree with you. I wonder if we agree for the same reasons. I don't think we need them. It's not like we need super rich individuals. Okay, we don't need like uber rich billionaires, like hundreds of billionaires. Like billionaires, sure, whatever. I'm not saying I'd necessarily have a problem with someone being a billionaire. That's fantastic if you made it that far. I don't think an individual having such an amount of wealth is like an integral part of the system. But I think the ability or the capability to become a billionaire needs to be available to people because people like your Jeff, your Elon, your Bill, your um, Tim Cook, your um, Microsoft guy, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, like these people need to have the ability to do big things. Like they're not going to, they're not just going to do it just to do it. Like, yeah, I'm going to come up with this great idea and like everybody's going to benefit and like everybody's going to get paid. And I'm only, I'm going to make the same amount of money as everyone else. Like that's not a good motivation to do something. Oh, no, actually not. If you're a tech founder, you're doing it because you're like, this is the next big thing, man. And we're going to make it huge. And then you do it and you get compensated for it. I don't, do you do you agree with me, Will? I do, because you know the poor are not going to solve world hunger, and the poor are not going to take us to Mars. And these now, Ooh. like, if there are, like, let's just say trillionaires, the first trillionaires, if they have such an obscene amount of wealth that we lose track of how many commas are in their bank account, and they do nothing with it, then I could see where people start having an issues. But Jeff Bezos built Amazon. You guys remember what life was like before Amazon? And how about Bill Gates? Bro, um, I remember life before Wi-Fi. Like <laughs> I remember, like I remember, like actual like dial-up internet, like the. You guys remember when Netflix would mail you DVDs? Yes, I do. And Kids when today, when Amazon sold books only. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, my my point being is, um, these uber rich individuals have contributed to society and have fundamentally changed the way that we live our lives. And if they didn't exist, what kind of advancements in technology and just civilizational development would we be missing out on if we didn't have these people who are contending to be the world's first trillionaires? Okay, Ben, I know you want to say something. I'm hoping that I can get your opinion on this. I'm going to bring it back to the concept of the episode. Who's, whose problem is that? Like, whose issue is that? Is it Jeff's issue to solve world hunger and... This is like almost oxymoronic to say, I guess, or just ironic in general, because I think that as a billionaire, having the capability to solve so many problems, you should just because you can, like you have that capability, like you should do it because I'm just, I don't know. I just feel like if you can, you should. But what I'm saying is 
and why I'm contradicting myself is like, is it really his problem or is it government's problem? Shouldn't government be fixing world hunger? Like, isn't that a government thing if they're going to provide for us? Like, well, you could you we, could make an argument that it's also a private problem. Yeah, because if your employees are starving, they're not going to come to work. That's you know that's a way. That's, to... a, that's a big brain play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a very interesting, interesting idea. And I I appreciate your sentiments, Justin. I believe that I would share and do share your sentiments. There's this long-standing tradition of philanthropy when you have incredible excess wealth. There's a biblical precedent for that. There's a societal precedent for that. There's even a virtue-esque precedent for, hey, if you are in a position of privilege, you know, share that privilege, share that wealth, share that knowledge, you know, the first billionaire and, you know, like the oil titans and the steel titans of the early 20th century, the Vanderbilts founded colleges, founded hospitals, founded centers for learning because they, they recognize that they have so much money. There didn't even exist enough money to actually have it all in a physical setting. And so they were like, all right, like, we need to do something. And it became this idea of, all right, I've been blessed. How can I bless the world? And that still exists today. You can still look and find examples of Jeff, Bill, Elon donating massive amounts of money. Now, does that also double as a tax write-off? Absolutely. (laughs) But that's a good thing. Like everyone's up in arms that like, oh God, like Tesla made X amount of money, but they're going to pay nothing in taxes. Like, okay. But they donated billions of dollars into X, Y, and Z, that money would not be there if it wasn't for this company. Like you can't be mad that they're not paying to, you know, fix the road on your street when they're helping cure cancer or, you know, genetically change food, you know, like these, these are pressing issues. Now what's the flip side of this argument? The flip side of this argument is stupid. I'm not going there. Um, that was, that was probably a little a little premature, uh, <laughs> a little opinionated on my part. A little. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that. I was driving towards Justin's point. You presented this idea of when you do get to be worth $200 billion, is it now your duty to make a difference at social change, at world policy at at world problems or is it the government's job i'm gonna take maybe an unpopular stance here and say that it is absolutely not the duty or obligation of wealthy individuals to make the change it should not be their duty Get now carrying out of here bro what okay all right. <laughs> well and and so I'm, I'm going to follow that up with saying, I think it's incredible and very, very positive and very good that they do. But it's one of these ideas where the vast majority of the people that are clamoring and outraged and saying, you have $200 billion, like, why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z, are n- not in any case contributing financially, with their time, with any of their resources to any of the causes that they believe that this individual, because they have attained a different level of wealth, whatever, should. So to simplify, it's my money and I decide what I do with it. That's that's a gross simplification. I think Uh, the key difference here... I'm so happy right now. No, no, no. Oh, no, not. No, no, no. I'm saying I think really... (laughs) I think Will is right. Like, that's the mentality is it's my money and I need it now. And we've seen that not only with individuals, but corporations. Like, if you look, starting in the 40s, 50s, like, if you gave your life even for just 20 years to a company, like, you were getting paid out a pension. There's no such thing anymore. Like, if you go work for a major corporation, like, they're not going to pay you a pension. Even if you give them 40 years of your life because they want to make more profit and bankrolling an employee who retires and is going to continue to live for 30 more years is expensive. So they've eliminated the pension altogether. So you've seen that with corporations who become increasingly for profit 
and individuals where like the virtue side of it, Ben, if you say, historically speaking, like if you had a large sum of money, you would just do things because it was very virtuous of you. Like, I mean, yeah, billionaires will donate money now, but like, at this point, like, why do you need $200 billion? Like, because you want it at that, like, you just want more. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm, okay. Very important set of words that you just said there. You don't need $200 billion. You Correct. want $200 Correct. billion. Dollars. Which means you don't want to solve world hunger, nor do you need to. If you're a billionaire, okay. you don't need to. But if you are not solving it, you also don't want to. Right. Well, and here's the thing. And I want to I want to make sure it comes back to this. As someone who does donate money and their time to charity, I am not a billionaire or even a millionaire. You know, like I am not someone that is blessed with incredible wealth. But I am still at this level making those commitments, making that choice, right? Like I know some people that make far less money than I do that are still giving to these causes, that are still volunteering, that still donate, whatever. These are not the people that are clamoring for Jeff Bezos to donate hundreds of billions of dollars to end world hunger or whatever cause of the year, whatever, right? It's the people that are doing nothing that expect someone who, it, who could do it, that they should do it because they have the means to do it. I think we all share a certain irritation for hypocrisy. Absolutely. Because if you take any of those people that you're talking about, the ones who complain but do nothing themselves, if you handed them a check for $2.5 billion, you're going to tell me they're not going to cash it? Of course, they would take that money and ascend into the 1%. But they right. would also lose it. Like, sorry, this is, this is going to take us in a direction that I don't necessarily want to go down because it's going to get us way off topic. But if you just wrote, we're already there. <laughs> yeah, like you're saying, you're just saying like they don't know how to like they would have no financial man financial exactly. Management like if you're the they type would just of blow it all, who, and then they would end up in poverty. Yeah, exactly. If you're the type of individual who's just looking for a handout, regardless of like if you're working and you just like don't care, or you're not working at all, and you're like, damn, like I wish we would tax these guys, and or I wish the government would like do something for me. And then if I gave you an extreme sum of money, you'd probably think your life was sweet until you burnt through it all because you have no idea what to do with it. Yeah, I can I can relate it. to this firsthand, you know, with <laughs> my uh, my student loans. That, that refund money goes fast. It goes so fast. I couldn't believe how fast I spent it. I spent it on stuff that I needed to sustain my lifestyle as a student, just in case Sally May is listening. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. Um, no, it, it, it's this very, very interesting idea. I have a friend. And I'll choose not to name him. Um, he had a relative pass, and at a young age, he was given an inheritance of close to fifty thousand dollars. And within a calendar year, like don't get me wrong, like at eighteen, fifty k is a lot of money, you know, like gets you pretty far. Um, that's a that's a life changing amount of money right there. Right. It really is. Within though. within three hundred sixty five days, he had none of it. And literally nothing to show for it. Didn't have a car, didn't have virtually, didn't have his housing paid for, didn't have anything. He spent it on food, money, like, you know, food, alcohol, taking friends out. You know what? I'll bet that guy ate like a king for a Absolutely. year. Absolutely. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's not necessarily wrong that he spent it. Uh, right? I mean... I guess it's his money. He can do what he yeah. wants. With it. It's his money. He can do with it what he wants. Now from Justin, who used to who still technically works in like wealth management and, you know, has all those licensures. He's like rolling over in his like proverbial grave. He's like $50,000. Like, come on, bro. Like put that in a retirement account. Don't touch it till you're sick, you know, something. And he, he himself will tell you, he's like, man, I should have done a better job with that money, but it's his to do with it what he wanted. Right. Yeah. Right. Now we can like, we can be like, man, like you goofed, but you know, we've never been in that position. Like neither will myself, nor I believe Justin has had $50,000 just handed to him. No. And it's one of those situations. And this is something that I really wanted to touch on in the previous point. When you talk to the incredibly wealthy individuals, like when Elon's in a, in a, in a interview, 
or when you get like, you know, deck of millionaires and they're like, man, I really thought I'd be satisfied at $10 million. Or, you know, if I had a hundred million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. Like I'd be satisfied. And this one guy, I can't remember who it was, but he basically said like, you don't know. You've never had it. You don't, you don't know that when you get there, you'll be satisfied. And for me, like, and again, this guy's in, in his interview, he's like, when I made a hundred million dollars, the last thing on my mind was, oh, well, I'm going to take it easy now. It's like, no, like it's, it's the same as making a hundred thousand dollars. Like your level of living changes, your level of expectation changes, the, what you're doing with that money changes. It's not as though you get to a hundred million dollars of total valuation. It's like you have a hundred million dollars in the bank account. Jeff Bezos doesn't have $200 billion laying around. He's got stocks. He's got a $50 million yacht. You know, he's got these things. And I'm sure he has a large amount of money accessible, but he doesn't have $200 billion sitting in his PNC bank account just waiting for him to cure world hunger, you know? Um, I can it's... I can relate to this. I got, um, I'm st- my tax forms are starting to come in um from last year when i spent most of it working and i made i made tens of thousands of dollars last year and it was more money than i have ever made in my entire life and all i want is to make more money than i made last year i would argue that the drive to get richer is stronger than the drive to get rich yeah 100 percent. like like i I was as, as i was walking around work today before this podcast i was thinking i was like man if i can just make more money than i made last year I'm going to be good. And then next year, I'm going to say the same thing, because as long as I continue to increase my annual income or my wealth in another fashion, if the amount of money that I have continues to grow year after year, then I will be satisfied. However, that will require work, more and more work, the more, you know, more money, more problems, right? There's a lot of things I kind of want to say about that, but I... I agree to a large extent. I agree. It's it's the case. You are not satisfied. And if you are satisfied, I think there's a difference of, of your perception of wealth. Now, to kind of loop this whole hour-long tangent back to government, I think it's the government's job to solve world hunger. But I that brings us to NATO. We made it back. We made it back. <laughs> now, is it the government's job to solve somebody else's hunger? Well, and so that's why I said NATO, because it's it's this idea, this alliance of governments to... I'm, I'm now, NATO is there, a military NATO, alliance. Not NATO. NATO. What's, what's the other? The UN. United okay. Nations. I'm thinking of NATO right now because we may or may not be going to war with Russia. We'll oh, yeah. Okay. Out. So just, just in case, those, those in the future are listening to this, um, uh, Russia has yet to invade the Ukraine at this point. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Guys, do you know your draft number yet? Because uh, I'm trying to find mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. Um, what was that question that I asked in the first episode? Should women be involved in the draft? Oh, and then we dodged it because it was too spicy. I still don't think I'm ready to answer it. Bruh. Yes. Yes, they should. End of discussion. <laughs> if they want equality, let's give it to them. <laughs> no. Equal fights equals rights. <laughs> but Russia said these hands are rated E for everyone. Send them. <laughs> Bruh, have you guys seen the video? It was in the it was it was during the Cold War. But there's video footage of a Soviet soldier in like boot camp setting where he runs, does a flying backflip and tomahawks a dude in a trench. <laughs> what? <laughs> like legitimately tomahawks him? Yeah. Like it, 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 it was like a dummy, but like he actually oh. like basically backflipped and tomahawked a dude in a trench. I'll send you the video. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to leave that part in the podcast when I upload this, but <laughs> can you imagine you're, you're fighting Russia and a homie with like a bottle of vodka and an AK runs your <laughs> position and just tomahawks the guy. A rather left. insulting Dude, I can't <laughs> even Oh, just imagine you're fighting some American with a pair of blue jeans, a bottle of whiskey and an M16. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Dude, I can't even comprehend like sitting with my back to a trench fire coming over my head and then you just hear... And some dude <laughs> in the trench and like hits the dude next to you and you're like, oh. <laughs> like let me see if I can get it. Huh? Okay, I'm, I'm so, looking at uh, government. 
government. Uh, okay, is it the government? Is it our government? Okay, no. Is it the government's job <laughs> to solve somebody else's hunger? Answer your own question, Will. If we get something out of it, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. Did I you mean, look it up? No, 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 no. I'm <laughs> laughing at, at Will. Like, I guess, but damn, like. All right. What are the alternatives? We um, alleviate hunger in some country in the global south, out of the kindness of our hearts. People are already pissed about paying taxes for stuff that they get. Exhibit A, right here. What do you think, Ben? I'm still on this tomahawk thing. <laughs> <laughs> My ADHD is kicking in. He needs more amphetamines. This might be time, fellas. No, we're, right, we're good. Sorry, I'm back. We're bringing it back. Yeah. I got the timestamp to edit this bit out. I'm curious if you're going to keep my line on the draft in there, too. You guys seemed really apprehensive to talk to me about that one. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm not actually that apprehensive to talk about it. I just like. Why aren't you ready to talk about it, Justin? Go for it. Huh? Why aren't you ready to talk about it? Are you th are you worried about the implications of your opinion on the subject? No. I'm kidding. I'm giving you a hard time. Oh. Um, here's my take. My take on world hunger. If you have the capacity, I think it should be done. I think it's a net positive for the world. And I absolutely believe that the capability exists today to do so. Um, I don't know if you guys saw on Twitter when like basically Elon addressed it and they were like, you know, X and Y, Z study said it would take this much wealth to end world hunger. Mm -hmm. and he's like, okay, well, if you can prove this with cross reference you know, studies and, you know, publications and all this, like I'll do it. And that fell silent because nobody effing knows what it would take to no, do it. That, no, it fell right, silent because Elon didn't want to follow through on it. Are you sure? I'm pretty positive. The dude was like, I will meet with you and show you comprehensive plans. And then he just dropped it. So Ben, right. you said that if I might have to, might have to solve world hunger. brush up on my Twitter. Ben, you said if we can solve world hunger, then we should. Like if people in another country are starving, then we should help them. Well, yes, absolutely. You going to feed the North Koreans? Yes. Here is where I'm going to come out with some more of my conservative beliefs. You know, as, as a man of faith and as a follower of Christ, I believe that is my calling. And personally, I think that every single man, woman, and child on this earth deserves to have a life worth living. Even and deserves, if they're pagan? You know, if they choose not to share my religious beliefs, that is fine. Yes, they still deserve food, shelter, and clothes. Now, what if they hate you? Turn the other cheek, brother. That was my last card. I'm done. <laughs> no, well, and, and it's fine. Like, and, and like, you're not. At, you are asking farcical questions, but the the sentiment's true. Do we feed the North Korean people? Yes. They don't. Just because they drew the unlucky card in the human lottery of the 21st century to be born in North Korea doesn't mean that they don't deserve access to clean drinking and food. Like, water, food, and shelter is necessary. Now, unfortunately. A large portion of that population has been brainwashed to try to kill us and to kill each other. But that doesn't negate the fact that they still deserve these things. They should still have human access to these things. If the North Koreans can be saved from their government, then that is an avenue we should pursue. But if they can't, then they are our enemy and they should be destroyed one way or another this is where and this is something i really um, go ahead justin i want you no you, no i'm just okay. no, i'm just go ahead yeah pipe in justin come on <laughs> no I, i'm gonna Don't pipe sit on the sidelines for this one i've been i've been fumigating on this the whole episode when we began talking about government we took a big left turn and it kind of went that way 
I was hoping it was going to go this way and I could say this up front. You as an individual personally have the moral obligation to dissent from your government if your government is acting in ways that are out of accordance with your beliefs. Now, that's a difficult thing to say. It's a much more difficult thing to do because if you defy the government, even on moral grounds, you are punished under that government's governing body, right? And you saw this during World War II when like U.S. soldiers would be, what's the word, when they wouldn't fight? Conscientism. Conscious, yeah. conscious objectors. Pacifism. They were thrown in jail. Some of them were like in World War One. like these people would be killed. Like they would basically be killed for cowardice on battle. Like they just would say, hey, I'm not going to do it. I don't know if that's right or wrong. I think the government should be held accountable for that because that I don't know that that's morally justifiable, but this question comes up of it's like, all right, if my government tells me to go to war or my government tells me to go kill Americans, but you know, that's wrong and you choose to do it anyways, like you're accountable, right? Like you, you cannot, take the shift of blame from yourself and give it to the government. Like the Nazis tried this during World War II, like the Nuremberg trials. They were basically like, hey, they made me do it. And it's like, okay, but like, there wasn't like a gun to your head. Like, and maybe in some, and in some cases there was, but that still doesn't mean that what you did is okay, right? It's for me, a very similar with the North Koreans. They were born in the setting. And it's one of these things where if they don't actively participate, they will be killed and everyone they know and love will also suffer, which is a very effective way of motivating human beings to do actions they may not agree with because it's uh, not just you where the buck stops. Yeah. I mean, I guess, but if, with that same argument, like if you're going to use world war two Germany, like there was the argument that was perpetuated for a long time that the Wehrmacht was not as guilty as the Nazi party itself. Like they were just following or the SS. Them. Or the SS, yeah, they, they didn't know, they didn't have access to that information, they were just acting on orders. But in reality, it came out and was proven like, yes, they all knew, like none of them were innocent. There's no absolution for the things that they did because they did it willingly, knowing what they knew. In the North Koreans, I mean, yeah, there's an extreme prop propaganda machine that beats every single day and every single night. And those people have been experiencing that for 80 years now at this point. But at the same time, it's like, they still know you have to know to a certain degree i mean you 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 just i, I well and so the this is where things get really hard because again i agree with you and i don't want to make it seem as though in this world war ii example that america's off the hook like we still oh, had no. japanese internment camps oh, no. we knew about the holocaust and choose not to make that public you know not public knowledge like there's no moral high ground in that setting now, obviously, when you're talking about the United States now in North Korea, there's a clear there's a clear stratification. When you get into indoctrination and brainwashing, I'm going to go back to World War II with what Japan did in the Okinawan Islands and all of the islands in the Philippines, like day and night, only for a number of years, they were fed these lies that convinced the populace to kill themselves rather than surrender to the United States soldiers. And even their own soldiers wanted to surrender, but couldn't because they were afraid that their buddies would shoot them or that their buddies would be punished if they defected. So it's this idea of how do you combat government out of control? With another government. Now, Ben, you said that as a citizen, it should be your duty to resist a government that you believe is doing wrong. Correct? Is that an accurate I did summary? say this. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have faith in God, that God has your best interest at heart, why can I not have faith in my government that no matter what it does, it has my best interest at heart there for them. Where if I give my give my loyalty to the state, that it will benefit me. Do I not have an obligation to obey authority, 
especially if it, that authority is legitimate. Are you making a North Korea? Is this is this what is this what's going on right now? Or you is, is this like any government? Any government. Our government, North Korea's government, China, Russia, Europe. Doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, cuz I mean, I guess in theory that that serious there are people out there right now. It doesn't have to be North Korea. It doesn't have to be some kind of authoritarian state. There are Americans that do that. 100%. Absolutely. I believe that above all else, I as a Christian am called to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. That does not mean that you tolerate evil or that you excuse those actions of other belief systems. Now, and I'm, I'm kind of missing your question here. Like, are you asking me what would happen from an ideological perspective? Like who, who submits to who or? My question is, why should you stand up to your government if you don't like what it's doing? Well, and so this is, the, I mean, this is- If this you is... stand up to your government, then that protector and provider that we mentioned earlier ain't going to be protecting and providing you. You're going to have nothing and you're going to be naked out in the wilderness, politically speaking. So why should you stand up for something when aligning yourself with that ideology that might not be evil, but you don't necessarily agree with is in your best interest? I think the question you're asking, Will, has more profound implications than the answers I'm going to give. But those that initially resisted the government's choices to allow slavery were prosecuted, ridiculed, you know, beaten. Some of them were killed. And now in our current society, we see them as the pioneers of this great social change. You're talking about historiography historiography but at the time they were committing treason against their government they were they were you know you can use harper's ferry as a great example he led a revolt against slavery and they hold up in an army and they got caught and you know they were all killed was what he did wrong at the time, the people that tried him, absolutely, but their government quickly fell out of power and within the next 10 years would no longer existed. And now the world that we live in, you know, at least publicly, slavery is illegal, right? Yeah, pretty sure it's thoroughly illegal. Well, unfortunately, more people are in slavery today than basically at any other time in human history. But that's a conversation for another time. Yeah, dude, trafficking is wild. Anyway, I guess human trafficking and slavery need to have separate definitions. But anyway, um, but no, and so Justin, to catch you up, Will asked me, go ahead, Will, restate your question. Do you have an obligation to obey legitimate authority if you disagree with it? And that's not necessarily evil but you just don't like it. And so my final answer to this is God will judge every single man, woman, and child for their actions. And that is the ultimate authority. Now, on the world setting, yeah, I mean, even, even Jesus set the precedent, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but that has to exist in the framework of other things outlined, like, I can't kill somebody. I can't murder, you know, I can't murder people. I can't steal. I can't lie. Like within that framework, submit, like if Caesar demands that I pay taxes, yes, I'm going to pay my taxes. Obviously in this case, Caesar is uncle Sam. He just wears a different hat and has a mustache. That still exists, but at the same time, like it's your duty as an individual to say no. And even if you're the only person that says no, and you get ostracized for it, those are the people that change history. I say change is bad. And the people that disagree are a anomaly that needs to be controlled. 
says the white male in his young 20s. We are all white males <laughs> in our 20s. I'm ethnically ambiguous. I don't male. think I don't think you have any obligation to submit to governmental authority if it truly goes against like your personal values and who's the libertarian now justin (laughs) no so i mean i can say that because so my personal belief is even if i disagree with something that i have to do at work or for the government or whatever as long as it's not crossing some sort of ethical or moral line for me like i'm going to do it because that's just one of those times when you should just suck it up and do your part and and you know actually be useful and productive like if you don't want to do something at work or for the government simply because it's a pain in the ass it's lifting crates or loading trucks and you're like oh my job sucks i don't want to do this like yeah you suck okay you just need to do it you just need to do your job or if it's like oh well the government you know requires me to vote i don't want to vote it's like okay well you need to vote because you have to we have to elect our officials for me i say that you don't have to listen because if you don't want to listen that's fine you you don't have to you'll just pay the consequence because there are times that you should listen and times that you shouldn't and the times that you should listen greatly outnumber the times that you should not the only times you shouldn't listen to authority are if you know in the case of like the american revolution taxation without representation or in the case of the civil war or you know whatever times where authority is questioned in a bad way sorry that was the way that i said that was horrible but basically when you truly need to stand on a moral pedestal and fight for what you believe in then no you shouldn't have to just obey blindly but i say that you can disagree because like yeah go ahead man if you don't like paying taxes and you want to move to a cabin in the woods and buy a 50 cal and you know keep keep your house stocked with full autos like sure okay like good good luck good luck that's all i'm gonna say like you won't get away with it for long Justin, all I could think about while I heard you say that is like, Hans grabs the juice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's actually that's that's good that you said that, Ben. That goes back to what I said about the Wehrmacht. Is like, none of them were innocent because they knew exactly what was going on. Like, right. okay, seriously, if America doesn't like being taxed without representation, okay and you ha- you wage a literal revolution to break away from your colonial overlord what is stopping a soldier in the wehrmacht from defecting like truly what is stopping you in the middle of the night from leaving like you might get caught and shot okay well if you fight for this cause that you don't believe in and then you get shot and die fighting for something that you don't even want to fight for like what is the difference if they defect they'll shoot your family okay uh, i mean I guess well, like, yeah, that's the unfortunate reality. It is the yeah. unfortunate reality, but at the same time, it's like you might not get caught. And if you're willing to take the risk, then you should. Well, and so this kind of loops back to this idea of, you know, standing up for what you believe in, even when it's hard. And like that's something that is lost a lot. And again, like it's one thing to say, like, oh, well, they'll shoot your family too. But like, millions of people did die for i don't i don't want to say millions hundreds of thousands of people died from choosing not to take part in the first and second world war and it wasn't just they like the individuals who were killed but if you as a soldier tried to defect and went back home in the soviet union they would kill you and your entire family and sometimes your entire bloodline like that's it. Like you goofed and now it's everybody pays the price. Or if civilians resisted, you know, the Wehrmacht moving into their town, line up 10 civilians, shoot them in the head. Like this is how we do stuff. Like that is evil. And those are individuals, each, you know, each one, a sentient human being who has his own life story, his own, his own, you know, struggles, his own joys that listen to a governing body tell him to do this and did it and scary like that's scary personally because it's very easy to allow yourself this idea of oh well i'm at work so i have to do what i'm told or i'm 
a soldier in the Wehrmacht or a U.S. prison guard at a Japanese internment camp, so I have to do X, Y, Z. You have a moral obligation to not. Yeah, I think the thing about work is, like, you don't have to. I mean, that's the whole, that's my whole point. Right. Like, you, you cannot work there. Whatever your employer tells you. If your employer tells you to do something that you are not comfortably with for whatever, comfortable with for whatever reason, based upon faith, based upon ethics, based upon morals, I mean, whatever, what have you, like, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. They're not putting a gun to your head like they employ you. Like, if it's truly something that you're willing to quit over, you should just not do it. 100%. I feel comparing your employer to your government is a little bit of a stretch. Absolutely. Because you if your government tells you to do something that you don't want to do, you can't just quit the United States. It's not that simple. <laughs> I quit <laughs> the Texas true. Republic of America. <laughs> you know. That is true, Will. It's a lot different when your government comes to your door and says, we need you to dig ditches. All right. So Say no. with everything that we've said tonight, I'm going to go ahead and rephrase the question that we opened this episode with in the terms that maybe our definitions and our answers may have changed slightly. What does government mean to you? Justin. Government to me means this question is so difficult to, to answer from um uh, from a linguistic standpoint like i don't know if i should describe the entity itself or the values that it encompasses so i guess i'm just going to go ahead and say government to me means sort of what we talked about earlier in a an effective efficient suitable body that serves the people and is by the people okay it should be elected and serviced by the citizens of its own country and it should act on its own volition in the best interest for those citizens i mean to me government represents the the foundation of what well, <clears throat> government represents a lot of what we require in our society infrastructure food um you know just nationalism things like that like government to me is never meant to be perfect it is meant to be criticized but it is meant to try its best i hope that answer makes sense ben what do you think justin i'm not sure that answer would get an a in my college government class i know dude <laughs> it's so hard to answer i'm giving i'm giving you crap when my answer is about to be way worse Government in actuality and government in ideology are very different. What does government mean to you? My previous statement still stands. Um, <laughs> the government is a tool necessary to the growth of society. And not just the growth of society, but the cultivation of new and furtherance of society. Um, but the government is also something that needs to be carefully and systemically guarded and also vetted to ensure that along its existence, it does not lose sight of its original intention, which is to serve the people. Yes, yes. Okay, Will, I am interested to hear your answer. Because every time you have said, what does government mean to you? I cannot truly, like, I don't know if you're, this is just me interpreting it so many ways. Like, what does government mean to you? Like, what does the word mean? Or like, what does government mean to you? Like, how does it make you feel? Like, I, I'm ready to hear your answer. There are somebody far smarter than I compared government to fire. When fire is well controlled, it will protect and provide for you. But if it's not properly controlled and left untended, it will destroy everything or it will completely abandon you. You know, what's really unfortunate when the guy who's going to give the last answer for the podcast has a better one than you sums it up that much better. 
Well, shout out to my man, Dan Carlin, for keeping this podcast series. <laughs> we heard that quote from Dan Carlin because Dan Carlin quoted somebody when he said that. So this is not. Shout out to that guy. <laughs> yeah, whoever that guy was, good for you. Because or woman. <laughs> I heard that line and it just stuck with me. So, you know, explain for the for the people who are tuning in what that line truly means to you and, and how you break that down. Government should build my roads and fight my wars and leave me to the rest of it. Should you fight your government's wars? Ask not what your government can do for you, Will. Ask what you can do for your government, man. Your president you, needs Kennedy. slugs. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, in closing, uh, viewers, please, if you guys want to give us any topic ideas, leave them in the comments. We are always looking for new and titillating um Titillating topics to discuss. I'm going to have to edit that. Um, Shout yeah, out this, to uh, Luke Wittenkeller. Your AI idea is really good. We're playing around with it and we're seeing what we can do, but we haven't forgotten about it. Uh, shout out to you, Luke. I don't even know that was an idea, but we're going to definitely talk more about it. Shout out to Will for reading the YouTube comments. Somebody has to. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ben McElroy. Uh, new episodes coming out almost every Tuesday. <laughs> and don't forget, to, uh, we are also on Spotify. Yes, please. Um, final thoughts. Government, mostly bad. Government's good. Government mostly, is good. Mostly bad. <laughs> mostly good. I'm, I'm going to edit out your guys' voices and just have it say mostly bad. <laughs>